show your support for the Untold Radio Network family of shows and join in on the conversation by using super stickers and super chats on YouTube. Got a question you want answered? Ask it live via a super chat and get real time responses from our shows, knowledgeable hosts and guests. Help keep the Untold Radio Network shows running strong. We need your support. Send your super chats and stickers now. There's a place I have found in the shade on the ground, far from a worries and troubling sound. When I go there to be by myself, only me. No one can guess what I came there to see. There's a sun in the sky. There's a cloud. distance I see someone waving at me. I hope that it's you, but who else could it be? Hey, welcome. It's Monday morning here in the Untold Studios for coffee time. Quick weekend, it flew by fast, but it was, a, it was a good weekend here. I hope everybody had a great weekend. We actually had the sun shining a little bit. It got above 30 degrees here, <laughs> melted a couple inches of snow. It felt almost tropical compared to what it has the last four months. So that was a welcome, welcome, uh, Welcome couple of days of sunshine here. Got a chance to get out in the outdoors and uh, go for a few few little walks through the, up in the, uh, we were up in the Pine Island Forest for a couple hours uh, Saturday morning. And that was fun. I tell you, I was... A lot of tracks as far as the wildlife out there. God, there must have been, I must have seen 10,000 sets of deer tracks, <laughs> I swear. But um, even saw one one set of bear tracks up there. So I, they were older. They were two days old. But I would have guessed it would have been a while before we started seeing them. But evidently, they're... They've got cabin fever too, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> but uh, welcome those in chat. Uh, thanks for joining us. My scheduled host this morning was Jim Myers, and I'm hoping he pops in. Um, might be having some technical issues. I'm not sure. So we'll see uh, see where we go with that. Hopefully he shows up. There have been some things in the news lately that uh, – you know, maybe people aren't looking at. I, I again, I try to stay away from the the politically motivated and uh, you know some of the divisive, agenda-driven news stories out there. I'm really focusing more on the stories that have to do with animals and nature and the earth and even some of the paranormal. Um, and try to pop them up here now and then. This one here I'll share, uh, I thought was kind of intriguing. I'm, I love learning about animals, you know, and uh, their capabilities and things that um, science is noticing with them. And, you know, I remember when I was younger seeing the movie Jaws for the first time. I don't know. How many in chat can remember uh, seeing that? I mean, it started a whole series of movies, Jaws 2, Jaws 3D. But, you know, like most, none, none ever really topped the original. And, you know, you think you learn about a shark watching a movie Jaws. But really... Um, over the years, I've kind of had an interest in different marine life because 
I guess maybe that's natural. You know, I love to fish. I, I do some guiding. Um, I've been fishing my whole life. And, and uh, as far as freshwater lakes go, I've spent a little bit of time fishing saltwater. But just that learning about um, life below that surface, you know, to me is interesting. Well, here's a story about a 1,200-pound shark that uh, – has been hanging out lately off the Florida Panhandle. It's a 1,200-pound shark was tracked um, very near the coast of the Florida Panhandle on March 6, 2023. Now, first of all, I don't think that's an anomaly. Even great white sharks are seen swimming around Florida often. But what really blew me away about the story is the range they have. Uh, the shark, affectionately known as Maple, is one of the great white sharks tracked by OSEARCH, a global nonprofit mission. Uh, its purpose is to help scientists collect previously unattainable data through its sophisticated system of tagging and tracking sharks. Now, through this research, they hope to accelerate uh, the oceans return to balance by protecting and educating the public about the balance keepers of the ocean, the great white shark. Maple was originally tagged by OSEARCH researchers on September 14, 2021, off Ironbound Island in Nova Scotia. The shark was named in honor of Canada's national symbol, the maple leaf. Uh, each tag that OSEARCH places on a shark is equipped with a transmitter. Researchers use the transmitter data to track the shark's movement and behavior. When a shark surfaces, the transmitter sends a ping that helps OSEARCH locate the shark. And a shark must cruise on the water's surface for 90 seconds in order to accurately locate where that ping comes from. If it doesn't stay on the surface full 90 seconds, uh, the ping just lets them know that the shark surfaced, but they don't exactly know where. Well, since her tagging in Nova Scotia, this 1,200-pound shark named Maple has traveled a bit further north. Her northernmost ping was on October 17, 2022, just last fall here where she showed up right off of the coast of Quebec's Magdalene Islands in the Gulf of St. Lawrence. Maple's, southern, Maple's most southern ping was only five months prior, which would have been last spring in May 27th. She serviced between the Florida Keys and Cuba. So really cruising the whole length of the eastern seaboard and then further south yet all the way down near cuba but her latest ping shows her willingness to swim the waters of the gulf of mexico many of the sharks at osearch tags along the eastern seaboard of canada and the united states remain on the atlantic coast but maple on the other hand is no problem rounding the southern tip of florida and swimming into the gulf her westward sighting was on February 8th, here a little over a month ago, when she was spotted off of the coast of Louisiana. It's one of the most western pings Osearch has recorded from the sharks it's tagged on the Atlantic coast. Her current location shows she is patrolling the waters off of Appalachian Bay off the Florida Panhandle. It has been close to a month since Maple's last ping, but the data shows she is moving closer to the beaches of the Panhandle. How long she'll stay in those waters is only a guess. And I, like I say, why did I find that interesting? I don't know. I guess really the most interesting thing about the story is the range. I mean, from Nova Scotia to Cuba, to me, that's, that's pretty incredible. But for this shark to circle the Florida, the tip of Florida and come up all the way along the panhandle over to Louisiana. And this is all within months. I mean, 
that's just amazing to me. It's just so amazing. 1,200 pound shark. So here's to you, Maple. I don't know where you're heading next. Hopefully, hopefully, uh, you can resist the urge to hang out too close to those Florida beaches and get back out into the open, open water. But yeah, no, I thought that was a really interesting, uh, Article. I've got another one here I'll share. Let me pull this up. This one is a scientific article that I found interesting. Um, let me just a second here and let me double check. Oh, there we go. So the, in this article... You know, we keep hearing stories about bees, you know, how valuable the honeybee is uh, to life, really, uh, on Earth because of their their needing role, um, how badly we need them in the pollination. So, uh, but here researchers have created a tiny fairy-like robot's that could replace dying bumblebees superior to its natural counterparts is what they say. Now, this is interesting because there is a picture here and this thing looks like the tiniest of dry flies you would use in fly fishing for trout. Um, Researchers in Finland have developed small fairy-like robots that can fly, which could help to pollinate vital crops using the globe. Uh, across the globe, I'm sorry. Uh, created at Tampere University, these tiny robots are made of stimulus, uh, stimuli response polymers. Stimuli response polymers, which in the past have been used as building materials in soft-bodied, remotely controlled robots. Uh, previous research has shown that these polymers can make robots walk, swim, or jump. This is the first time that researchers have found a way to make their stimuli-responsive robots fly. Um, Weighing just 1.2 milligrams, these new Tinkerbell robots are so porous and small that they can travel by floating through the wind. They are also light responsive, meaning they can be controlled using light inputs. Um, yeah, the, the article goes on. It is intriguing, but that is what they look like right there. That is crazy. Very, very interesting. Um, so that'll be something to keep an eye on. You know, I, 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 I'm reluctant anytime somebody says that something artificially made works better than uh, something that, you know, God made or something that's natural, like a honeybee. But um, who knows? That, that'll be some interesting... Uh, Interesting science to keep an eye on. Um, and then the last story that I had tagged uh, has to do with, uh, you know, a little bit with the UFO type news that's been in the in the news so much lately and kind of the the involvement that we've seen in People that normally don't get involved in this sort of thing. Uh, we're talking about we we're talking about a, you know fairly well credentialed uh, professors, um, some government officials, things like that. People having these open discussions now. Um, We've got the Pentagon and Harvard researchers look into alien motherships to explain sky phenomena. This is an interesting article. Uh, it is in the Daily Digest. 
in a paper draft, still inner, I'm sorry, still unreviewed by peers, <laughs> which kind of made me think, okay, here we go. The Pentagon and Harvard and Harvard, the Pentagon and Harvard suggested that an unidentified object found in 2017 could be a mothership sending small probes to Earth, similar to NASA mission to explore another planet. Okay. The scientific pair calls for a more strict approach to evaluating unidentified aerial phenomena, sightings in the document. Um, UAP is a new term. Okay, we all we all know that. That's, the, that's today's UFOs. UAP. The paper also considers that an artificial interstellar object could potentially be a parent craft that releases many small probes. Um, these dandelion seeds, quote, could be separated from the parent craft by the Tidal gravitational force of the sun, and by a maneuvering capability, it continues. Um, the paper attempts to use physics to rule out sightings of objects that seem highly maneuverable. Researchers looked at Umamua, I guess, a UAP found in 2017 by the Pan-STARRS telescopes near the Earth. Oh, wait, I should probably back that up. I don't know what this is a picture of, but that is what they're showing uh, on that slide. O-U-M-U-A-M-U-A, -A -A. Aumuamua. I don't know if that's how you just pronounce that. <laughs> Uh, defy, this thing defied the laws of physics by appearing to move in a direction and speed that seemed impossible. It didn't generate a fireball or radio signature in the radar as it should have. Um, could be equipment errors. Paper also suggests an alternative possibility, equipment limitations and optical illusions. The lack of all these signatures could imply inaccurate distance measurements uh, for single site sensors. A congressional hearing, according to Forbes, defense officials demonstrated how night vision goggles used with a camera lens could make an out-of-focus drone appear as a blurry triangular object in congressional hearings last year. The Harvard author, Avi Loeb, uh, acknowledged these points during interview with NBC Newsnight. Loeb, a Harvard astronomer, wrote the paper with Dr. Sean Kirkpatrick, director of the Pentagon's All Domain Anomaly Resolution Office. Now, I've been hearing a lot about that lately, the AARO. Uh, it's an office that just was just simply created last year. Uh, the AARO opened in July 2022, according to Fox News. It is responsible for tracking objects in the sky, underwater, and in space. Uh, get the Galileo Project. Loeb, on the other hand, directs the Galileo Project at Harvard. The initiative are, uh, aims to use scientific methods to, to evaluate hundreds of UAP sightings that have recently become public. Loeb is a respected scientist, but he also he has also pre, uh, presented himself more as a believer in extraterrestrial activity uh, than a debunker. According to Forbes, the astronomer suggests that the first object detected in our solar system was an artificial probe sent by intelligent aliens in his book, Extraterrestrial, the first sign of intelligent life beyond Earth. 
Uh, the magazine recalled that he has also argued that some meteorites that have hit the Earth might be interstellar and not from within our solar system. So, yeah, that, uh, again, another interesting article in science, whether or not... Um, whether or not uh, you subscribe to what they are talking about there, I do think that it is, it's interesting. I mean, I, I guess uh, the most interesting part of it, I guess, is who's having the conversation, right? It, that we're talking about um, a Harvard, uh, astronomer who's head of the department and we're talking about uh, some officials from the u.s government having a conversation about how what may simply be a very very large uh, uh floating rock could be a mothership that is releasing um these little dandelion seed type probes to take a look at the earth so um that, that's interesting but i guess we'll find out more uh it honestly this is a landscape that seems to be getting updated almost daily in the news uh on sites all over i guess a person's gonna start having to be very careful about what is real and what is not real, what can be trusted and what can't be uh, when it comes to your news sources uh, when looking at that type of thing. But yeah, it's, um, it is something that definitely is capturing an, an awful lot of attention lately. So Let's talk a little bit about Untold and where we've been here this last week uh, with the network. I'm just reading on another screen, so I apologize for looking like I'm not paying attention uh, or being staying up here with my face in the camera. But um, last week uh, on Sasquatch outpost uh they talked about the paranormal bigfoot uh mysterious libraries with dr dean bertram and jason mclean uh talked about the mountain of god ufo cult <laughs> it's a cult that's out there um there's been a book wrote about it uh, that was on Mysterious Library, which for those of you that are unfamiliar with that show, the interesting thing that they do, the kind of their shtick or their format is to review a book uh, that's wrote in the kind of paranormal uh, area of literature. And it may be one that's fairly recent. It may be one that that isn't. And, they talk about what's covered on, on that and, and um, they get some input from everybody. <laughs> I think Jim will be popping in here pretty soon. <laughs> we, we didn't uh, calculate for the time difference, I don't think, but. Um, and then another uh, show that we have here on the network is. Um, Let's see, this was on Wide Open Research. Dr. Russ and Brad had Butch uh, Hiles on, who is an MMA artist, and they covered a little bit um, about self-defense and fighting in the streets, and um, that, that was kind of an interesting show, not something you normally would see, but they talk about kind of the science of addressing a threat and how to um, approach that and defend yourself. Uh, also, Down South Anomalies. Um, our friends in Australia were talking about the Yeti, Bigfoot, and Sasquatch go to the movies. Um, that was the theme, but yeah, you'll have to pop in and check that one out. Uh, 
then also they had um, Polly Wallace, uh, Ancient Aliens and the Golden or in the Garden of Eden. Okay. Um, let's see what else we had. Talking Weird, uh, they had a St. Patrick's Day special. That was interesting. I saw caught caught a lot of that. Um, and then uh, I noticed uh, Dana and and Tim last night on the Bigfoot influencers had my guest from uh, earlier er, last week on Monday, uh, Todd Neese on uh, Bigfoot uh, native culture and conservation with Todd Neese. And that was a great show. I tuned in and watched that too. So um, got Jim backstage. Hey Jim, how are you this morning? Good. Hey, I apologize about the confusion. I thought <laughs> this was 10 30 my time. So, oh, yeah. you know, Whenever I make a thumbnail, I always try to reference East Coast time since that's <laughs> the one everybody. So I put 11:30 a.m. East Coast on the thumbnail, and then when we're in Streamyard, I'm scheduling it. It wants to go by Central time because that's where we are here right. at Untold. And then a lot of my guests in this community with Bigfoot are from the Mountain and Pacific time zone, so. <laughs> Oftentimes we find ourselves wrestling with. Well, that, that was my bad. I apologize about that. <laughs> no, that's all right. I'm glad you're able to make it and join us. Uh, so how have you been? How was your weekend? Week has been busy. Um, I'm, I'm working on um, this new movie room for a museum, and it's going to be uh, a cave, basically. So I'm, I've got wire mesh all around the room and spray foam and mortar mix. And uh, it's just a, it's a lot of work, but hopefully it'll be really cool when we get done. That will be neat. So that, that part of, and for those who maybe, you know, those who tune in to, to, to your show, my show, a lot of them understand, uh, where you're located and what it is, but for those who maybe are listening on podcast or, or are unfamiliar with it, um, Jim has a an unbelievable museum or an attraction set up to that doesn't really just leverage the whole, um, you know, kind of the the culture presentation of Bigfoot, but also is very educational and um, interactive. So maybe you can tell us a little bit about that. He had to step away just for a second here. Get him back. A lot of people popping in here into the chat this morning. Appreciate you guys watching and and uh, appreciate your comments. Um. <laughs> this day is incredible. My uh, my computer just went dead. Oh, that's all right. We 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 survived evidently. But no, I was going to ask you a little bit about the museum. You know, yeah. kind of its inner its interactive aspect that makes it such an educational opportunity for people. Well, we try to make it as interactive as we can. We don't have a lot of space. When I get done with this theater, we'll have about 800 square feet. So it's not very big for eight, 850, but um, we, we have tried to make it interactive by um, adding a lot of, we have, we have videos people can watch, m multiple videos around the museum they can watch. We have, um, games for them to play as they come in. We've got a, a, we call it Bigfoot Bingo. It's basically to, as people go through the museum, to test what they're learning as they're going. So they have to try and get a bingo on things that they've learned. And we give them a prize. And then we have a animal scavenger hunt. I've got, I've got uh, animals all over the museum and the store that they have to find. So it's, it's really, um, 
trying to we've got we've got sound effects that they can listen to so it's i didn't want to make it just a thing that people walk through and didn't participate in any way in it and so we're trying to make it as participatory as possible and i think when we get this new room finished we'll probably we'll be able to feed uh, seat about 20 or 25 in there and uh, i'm hoping we can do um in the evening after hours do uh, a movie or a documentary for people who want to sign up and come in we can only fit that many but those who want to come be a part of that can can sign up right now we have no space for anything like that any meetings of any kind so this will give us a little bit more space <clears throat> wow that well it's a, that's exciting to know that you're growing as much as you can with within the space you got. Yes, I suppose exactly. you're you're probably exactly. really making good utilization of every square inch you can find there. Well, this the room that we're converting was a storage room, and we moved the storage, all the all the uh, merchandise upstairs, and we had had a tenant upstairs who's now gone. So upstairs became storage, downstairs becomes a theater. So we're just trying as you say trying to use as much as we can yeah well boy i'll tell you as a father of two sons who you know at their age now it's hard to get them really intrigued they've kind of got their own interests that they follow but i can remember when they were you know six seven eight nine years old to where you'd go on vacation and find an interactive experience like that. And they were just in it to win it, man. I can't imagine how, I mean, really for you, that must be one of the most awesome feelings that you can have is to see a young person come in and just be captured by all of that. It is. And, and they, they get their parents captured. The parents come in often for their kids, even though it's not, it's not a museum that's designed specifically for kids. We try to cater to kids, but it's it's designed to be educational. And I tell people in our gift store, uh, we're, we're intentionally having fun, poking fun at ourselves and Bigfoot and by the, by the merchandise we sell. But once you walk into the museum, it's a very different situation and we, we want it to be very educational and not be something that um, people would find <clears throat> funny. Um, but that hopefully they find it interesting, but kids love it. I mean, we have families that come back over and over and over every year when they come to Colorado, they come to see what's new at the outpost and it's great fun. Yeah. That's cool that you kind of have that contrast of, you know, the fun and games that exist in the store area, but really the a very realistic approach to the phenomena in the rest of the museum. And, you know, it makes me think about when I was, first of all, I wanted to say thank you, Uncle Bones. Thank you yes, so much for, you the, for the super sticker. That's awesome. Um, but, you know, we often hear, and I incorporate this into so many of my interviews, I'm sure you do too, where we're asking guests, you know, so what first got you intrigued in this, right? And for many people, it's, you know, the Patterson-Gimlin film. Or, the, you know, they saw something that just kind of lit that little spark and got them going in that direction. But I can't imagine that, I mean, we're going to be a generation from now, decades from now, where people are going to ask somebody, who maybe is working very diligently in, within science and within research, um, learning what we can learn. I, mm -hmm. And they might say, I remember as a kid, I went through uh, a Bigfoot museum that blew me away, <laughs> you know? Well, if I can move somebody from, I don't believe at all, to me it's a myth or a legend, to... I can see that this could be a possibility. Then I feel like I've done my job. Um, yeah. We do have a lot of people that, that come in as skeptics, go through the museum and leave saying, no, until I see one myself, I'll never believe. And, you know, there's nothing I can do to convince someone like that. Yeah. So um, I don't even try, but um, people who are 
I call them honest skeptics, meaning they don't believe in Sasquatch, but they think that there could be a possibility. They're not closed to the idea. Then I can have a dialogue. But if they, if their attitude is no, there's no way it could exist. Yeah. There, there's not really any room for discussion there. It's amazing how quickly and how fast uh, here in the United States, especially that culture is changing with that. I mean, I, I oh, yeah. saw uh, a three-year-old survey I think it was about three and a half years now where they asked people, and I understand a lot of, a lot of it's in the way the questions asked, but they had asked, do you believe that it's possible that Bigfoot could exist? And 18 or 13% of Americans that they had surveyed, and this is over a thousand people that were in the survey, 13% said yes. Simply two years later, which is about a year ago, uh, that number grew from 13 to 18 percent. So to grow five percent in, you know, a year and a half, two years, part of me kind of feels like maybe that's the the um, the programming we're seeing mm -hmm. on, you know, five years ago, there was maybe one or two shows. Now it's like every night there's something to watch on TV about all the different phenomena that exist when it comes to UFOs and ghosts. I mean, there's all kinds of programming, but the Bigfoot programming that's out there for people to at least learn a little bit about, not saying it's all accurate for sure, but sure. for them to get an introduction to the subject or at least a place to start, I think is so, uh, so in place now compared well, to does five, that does that ago. percentage surprise you would you have expected it to be more than 13% i think uh i think again it's a lot in how you yeah ask that question you know you ask somebody just out of the blue somebody walks you and say do you believe in bigfoot i believe that that, that you're probably going to be looking at less than 10% uh it, do you believe it's possible that bigfoot could exist that's probably fairly accurate where it's at. I would think though, that if they said, um, you know, if you were to ask the question um, when you, you kind of lead into it uh, and you see this done a lot, when you consider how much remote wilderness there is in North America, yeah. do you think it's possible that something could exist like Bigfoot and not be discovered yet? you might be pushing 25, 30% the way that question's answered. But. Well, here's something I would like to try. And I, I, this will take some figuring out, but I, I want to get in touch with as many organizations, um, Bigfoot research organizations in the country as possible and find out how many, sightings have they documented of their own people or people that have come to them and uh, uh my computer keeps telling me it's gonna die here but it's plugged in so i hopefully it doesn't but <laughs> um but you know the the figure is thrown out there ten thousand. i i believe it's higher than that i believe the number of eyewitnesses is significantly higher than that but i don't have any tangible data to prove that so you know, I want to get a hold of every Bigfoot museum in the country, um, all the research groups that I can that I can reach out to and say, how many do you believe um, you can document and see how what number we come up with? Because I yeah. think it's a, a large number. You know, I, I think that less than half of the people who are alive right now who have had an encounter have probably came forward in report. Oh, I agree. They most and, people don't say anything. Yeah. No. I went decades without saying anything just because one my, the career path that I chose, I was going to create financial suicide if I talked to anybody. But yeah. You know, part of part of that is creating an atmosphere in which it's okay to talk about it that it isn't yeah, tab. Exactly. And um I think that that's key. And so I, I love seeing more and more uh, research organizations popping up, more and more events taking place. I know there's part of us that 
tongue in cheek says, man, how many more conventions do we need? You know, but understanding that all of these conventions, whether or not you feel the speakers are the same ones every year, or, you know, they just, some people want to look at them and try to attribute a three ring circus type mentality to some of them that I don't do that. I look at every one of these as an opportunity for somebody who may have had an encounter Mm -hmm. and for whatever reason, couldn't find the right room to stand in and open their mouth. This is an opportunity for them to talk to somebody and say, this happened to me. And yeah. um, I mean, there's probably, uh, that's another thing I, I want to count. How many Bigfoot events are there every year in this country? And there's got to be 50 to 100, somewhere around there. I mean, oh, I, I think if you added them up, there's probably, I would guess there's probably over 200. I mean, because, they, you know, we hear about the bigger ones, but, yeah, you know, just in, there's a lot of little ones, though. There are a lot of little ones. And, and even some of them may have just started as, camping outings amongst 10 or 15 sure. people and then it just kind of grew and then they thought well look we would just as well get a speaker next year and spend a day talking about this stuff and so these casual events have kind of grown into formal events i think yeah, yeah. but and there's you know there's as you said there's the big ones that can draw several thousand people but i know a lot of conferences and we've put them on we would have 100 or 200 people there and we felt good about that. I mean, that was a good draw for our area. And, you know, those kinds of conferences, yeah, there could be over 200. Who knows? Yeah. Um, you know, because it's, they don't it's, publicize nationally. They'll publicize in their state or in their region, but that's it. Yeah, you know, when you look at uh, kind of how the BFRO, as far as an encounter database is kind of established itself as the place to go look at at least. I know there's others that are doing this. Uh, We've got the Bigfoot mapping project, things like that. But, um, you know, that's kind of what I look at the BFRO as being um, very useful for is just the fact that they have a very organized high collection of encounters recorded. But, um, I think that when we need kind of the same thing for events and opportunities, educational opportunities, uh, speakers uh, giving presentations, even if it's online or virtually rather than in person, if there was kind of a go-to place to say, I've never, I'm, I'm going to be in Tennessee on vacation what's going on down there you could look and see hey, there's this little town is a festival this one has kind of the chamber of commerce so to speak on uh on bigfoot related events that i think would really be interesting mm-hmm. i know there's a ton of places that do that but boy i'll tell you what almost every one of them, you go look at what they've got scheduled it's a fraction of what's really happening out there because i yeah. don't think there's a go-to spot that everybody recognizes, you know? And you get, you get speakers from, from every persuasion when it comes to Sasquatch, obviously you've got, uh, there's at least four categories I'd say of those who would say Sasquatch is an ape or some version of ape, that they're some version of a human, that they are aliens or that they are, uh, the Nephilim or some some um, biblical historical figure. So, you know, and and uh, the good conferences, in my opinion, are the ones that have people from f- multiple persuasions <laughs> so that you can hear different perspectives on that. And yeah, um, because because every every one of those groups has their, you know, what they believe is their evidence and their reasons for believing what they do and. And to be honest, none of us really know. I mean, come yeah, on. We, you know, that's know that's one point. thing that yeah. we wrestle with as hosts. I think, you know, I try to get a lot of different viewpoints and and but I, you know, I try to look at I often say I start with the flesh and blood approach to this. And then when my data shows me something different, I'm willing to walk somewhere different. But when it comes to a a hypothesis or people's thoughts and ideas, I want to hear them all. 
Sure. Because sure. even if I don't agree with it or I don't subscribe to that theory, that doesn't mean I can't learn something from no, it. No, exactly. Exactly. Um, and I, you know, to me, a good researcher um, is going to follow the data. Now, they may not understand the data that they're getting, or they can't explain the data, but if you close off, I mean, if you're getting legitimate data in one direction or the other, and you won't follow it because your preconceived idea says, no, uh, they're this way or they're this way. I mean, I've changed my mind. <laughs> I can't even tell you in 10 years how many times I've changed my mind because of some new data I get that I think, okay, that doesn't match what I've been thinking, but um, this is what it said. This is what the data is telling me. And, and that's science. I'm not saying just make stuff up, obviously, but I'm saying where your scientific data takes you or eyewitness testimony takes you, even though I've never had something like that happen, they did. And yeah. if they're credible yeah. people, then I have to take that seriously. Yeah. And, you know, the, and then there's also another aspect, even on top of that, is that, um, you know, as one of the things that I've noticed, I've, I'm, I'm certainly not going to say that anybody who comes to me and says they're, they've had an experience that automatically I must believe them. I mean, yeah. I, I get that, right? I, I've heard almost all of the Sasquatch chronicles of Wes Germer out there. And I, I'll, I'll say that probably a third, maybe even a half are either embellished or not real to begin with. But yet I've heard so many of them mm -hmm. that when you look at the source and the integrity of the source and the, and whatnot that I, I believe they're probably real. And so, but on top of that, when somebody comes to you and says, let me tell you what happened to me and there's inconsistencies and red flags and things like that, it's still not a reason for me to not be respectful towards this person. Sure. Cause here's what I'm looking at. If I don't believe that happened to them, but they do believe that mm -hmm. it happened to them they are in a position where they need, you know, some type of assistance here, whether that's somebody to listen to them, whether that's professional uh, uh, evaluation, I don't know. But I mean, you know, just to hear somebody say something and think, well, because that's never happened to me, there's no way that could happen to you right. is the absolute worst approach that you could take to this. But, yeah, I mean, it's like it, crossing over to another topic of UFOs, people that say they've been abducted. I've never been abducted. I hope I never am. <laughs> but um, people that say they were and can tell you everything that happened. I mean, yeah, for me to say, no, that didn't happen to you. One, what right do I have to say that? Because I'm not the person that experienced it. And And even with Sasquatch, I try to... Um, I try to weigh people, and what I mean by that is if I know them well, then I try to weigh what they're telling me against their character and what they have, you know, they do they have a habit of lying about things? If they do, that's one thing, but if they don't, then they're either telling the truth or they're telling the truth as they experienced it, and so I can't say, no, that, that didn't happen to you. Um, and and to be honest, in all the years I've been doing this, I'll bet I've only met or had people come to tell me a story, uh, a handful who are I thought were really just out there. I mean, just lying and yeah. trying to impress me with what they were telling. Yeah, most people don't have don't have a reason to tell me. There's no benefit to them. <coughs> you know, there's, there's potential downsides for them for telling us. Story. And yeah. so I, I'll always listen, but I really think only a handful have been bogus. I think that anybody who's going to share an experience, whether it's to one person or to a room full of people or, or online potentially to the world, uh, goes to a risk versus reward, um, yeah. you know, scenario in their head. And I also understand there are, there are people I've seen it happen. Actually, it was very interesting how this happened on a friend of mine's channel. Uh, there were several of us on a panel and on this panel, 
with Steve Coles, the the squash detective, uh, Leon Thompson, who's well known for body language and and uh, PTSD analysis, things like that. Um, and I'm trying to think who else was there. there but there were several people who look at hoaxes and try to discern, mm -hmm. uh, you know, whether or not somebody's actually just experiencing something that they believe happened to them or whether or not somebody's actually contri you know, you know, kind of a premeditatively putting together a story to garner attention for whatever reason. Right. right. And we had a guy pop on that said, started making some really outlandish claims. And everybody on this panel was asking him questions about, well, what about this? How did this happen? Can you tell me how that happened? They certainly weren't attacking him. They were asking very valid questions. And in the end, the next day, this person contacted one of them and said, I'm not being honest. I made oh, that wow. up. And they, instead of disowning this guy or lighting him on fire, they got to know him very well, started communicating with him because there, there was this intrigue of why does somebody do this? Yeah, yeah. And they found, they, they got to know him. They actually took him out to eat. They actually took him out in the field and showed him what mm. it looks like. But this guy was lonely, lonely he had lost his family members uh he wasn't married didn't have kids was home every day and was kind of living vicariously his life through chats and youtube you know and um couldn't really connect to people well and he thought making this up would make people look his direction and and Maybe these people would want to talk to him. And he came out and was very open. They did interviews with him about it. And quite honestly, I mean, you, you couldn't help but show some compassion to how this yeah. man felt and where he was when he did this. It wasn't some villain who came <laughs> out and tried to deceive everybody for money. You know? Well, no. And at least he had the character to come back and say, okay, I have to confess. I mean, a lot of people yeah. wouldn't even done that. They would have just wanted you to believe that what they had said was true. And so that showed some character for him to come back and, you know, apologize about that. That, that to me is something. Yeah. Yeah. You know, a funny thing here is when we first built this store. So this is about 2000, we opened in 2013 and people that would come in, um, with a story, they would wait till there was nobody in the store hmm. or that nobody was within earshot. And they'd come up to the counter and they'd, they'd whisper their story. <laughs> and now this has changed dramatically because now people will come and they'll walk up to the counter and they'll tell their story. And other people in the store, I see turning and listening or moving closer so they can listen. So then we'll end up with this group of people around the counter listening to a story or if I'm telling someone a story, other people in the store come and listen. So that kind of stigma, I think is, is going away when it comes to this. Topic. Yeah. Maybe you should make kind of the confessional over in the <laughs> corner with a curtain on it and a camera in there. They can just go in and pull the curtain shut and oh, say, that's funny. That's funny. I'm going to tell my story. Idea. Yeah. It'd be I'll, interesting I'll to see. All the I'll hear your story in secret and, no, that's funny. Um, but you're well, right. Gotta, what you said earlier, most people don't ever talk about it. That's or many people don't ever talk about. Yeah. It. You know, I think just having that, you see that a lot. We talked about that before on the show where, um, you know, some of it's just the environment you walk into, you know, I've seen it with, um, Dr. Russ Jones and uh, Brad uh, on their show, uh, Wide Open Research, Russ has walked up to people in parking lots at Menards mm -hmm. and other places and said, do you believe it's possible that Bigfoot could exist? And he's filming them. Just thought, hey, I got a TikTok. Just wanted to ask you a quick question. Is that okay? And they're like, yeah. And he says, do you think uh -huh. that Bigfoot could exist? You know, you get an awful lot of no's. Or I, I don't, I have no clue. 
But every now and then you get a person saying, saying, absolutely. And they start going into a story about how an uncle this or whatever. And it's just amazing yeah. how some people, it wouldn't matter where they're at. They'll, if they've got an opportunity, they're willing to talk about it. other people. Not really the same. I mean, walking into a restaurant in Kansas City, Missouri and saying, does anybody ever had an experience with Bigfoot? Everybody's going to look around. Even if they have, they're going to oh, look yeah. around. They're not say, well, say I'm it. not raising my hand. No, not, Yet no. you walk into a bait shop up here in northern Minnesota or a, or a, you know, a backpack kayak shop in Spokane, Washington, and say, has anybody ever had an experience that didn't have a natural explanation to it that could have been Bigfoot? Hell, I probably half the place will yeah, raise their yeah, hand. Probably. You know, it's just, probably. it's a little bit easier environment to, to have the conversation. Um, but I agree. I got to um, ask you about, uh, as far as, you know, obviously, when you decided to kind of start the museum, I'm kind of curious as to was a lot of this stuff that you were featuring in there and, and going to put in there part of a personal collection or is it, do you have stuff there that maybe is on loan from other people that people can look at? Um, um, both. We opened it in 2016. So we opened the store in 13, even though we were, in 13, we were mostly a grocery store and a little bit Bigfoot. By, by 15, I'd say we had trend, made a transition, but we, op we, we opened the uh, museum in 16, and we opened it in phases. We had one phase we opened in 16, and then we expanded it in 18, and, and we expand, we're expanding again now. But um, And it started off with... Um, basically my own research, a lot of photography I had done of tracks that we had found of tree structures of things that, that, and I built, actually built a Bigfoot um, uh, out of, that was quite a project. I built it out of high density foam that I carved and uh, it took me about three months to build it. And, and it turned out pretty well, I have to say, but we called him Boomer. Um, and, uh, so we, we, um, we had a map of Colorado and we started tracking other people's sightings and our own. So it started off really as, as our own research, but then, um, we, uh, as, as we became better known and people figured out what we were doing, they started bringing in plaster cast footprints, mostly. And I've got a good a good number from North America Bigfoot Search, which is Dave Pilates organization. Mm -hmm. I probably got, I don't know. He he acquired a collection, oh, a few years back of maybe 20 plaster casts from across the country. So we we have a lot of those. But in, since then we've had other Colorado researchers donate. Um we have a flag. This is an interesting. Thing. We have a flag from Nebraska that uh, a big American flag. I think it's I think it's uh, five feet by or six feet by three feet, whatever the dimensions are. It's too big. I can't even fit the whole flag. I had to fold it up, but it's been ripped and then braided. The ends are braided, and um, this is apparently fairly common. Uh, the the person who gave me this flag. I had seen it in her museum in Nebraska, uh, Harriet McFeely, and um, she, she, uh, she said she went to a ceremony where they were going to, you know, they when you have flags that are used, they burn them in a ceremony. It's a very mm -hmm. solemn ceremony, and they had a hundred flags, and of the hundred, thirteen of them were ripped and braided, and so these braids are down to tiny, tiny little braids on the ends. It's really interesting, and I. I obviously can't say what braided it, but I don't know why people would rip a flag and braid it. Yeah. But, but that was donated. And so we've got um, uh, 
some sculptures that were donated. I mean, we we've tried to go beyond what I can acquire in my own research and bring in evidence from other researchers as well, because I think that makes the museum richer the more people that are represented in there. So um, yeah, it's it's a mix of both. Nice. You know, when we um when you came to the network and joined Untold Network uh, doing your show. Um, I was excited when I first talked to Doug about it because Doug was telling me, you know, this guy's a true cowboy, man. <laughs> and, you know, I grew up, I grew up in South Dakota. My dad has a ranch out by Fort Pier in the middle of the state. Um, lots of horses, mm -hmm. uh, spent time riding horses, um, some horses that weren't real friendly <laughs> and others that were, but I was the son of a hunting guide who, um, you know, he did an awful lot of guiding. My dad did up yeah. in Northern Idaho, all across Montana, Wyoming. And a lot of these were kind of pack hunt type outings mm -hmm. where you'd take two hunters and you'd have two guides that, you're using horses to pack wall tents and yep. you know everything a firebox uh everything you're going to need to survive for 8 to 12 days completely off the grid i mean nowhere near a convenience food store. everything yeah yeah and so when i started watching some of the things that you've shared on facebook and kind of the amount of time that you do on horseback i found that really intriguing because um you know when you go back and look at the original patterson gimlin approach there mm -hmm. wasn't four wheelers and pickup trucks yeah. and you know they were in a very remote area and they'd rode in on horseback mm -hmm. and um i'm often intrigued by that natural quote approach to uh something like that but can you tell us a little bit about what it's like for you i mean i you know do you have the horse are they your horses are they somebody you go with or how does that What's it look like, Jim? I, I have owned horses. I don't currently, but um, no, it's a friend of mine who's my partner when in the horseback side of it. Um, she lives about two hours south of me at the bottom end of my county. She's got seven horses. She used to do outfitting in the Sierras in California for fly fishermen. She would take guys... The fishermen would hike in. She would, like you were saying, she would carry all the gear in on the horses. And um, and she did that for many years. So she had experience. Her horses um, understand the packing concept. And um, and she had the pack saddlebags and everything that we needed for that. So it's worked out well. And, and Jill and I get along great. So she, um, what that's like is, well, I have to preface it to say um, her horses, okay, the property she lives on um, is frequented by Sasquatch, that's all I can say, by a number of them. And these horses have gotten used to having these creatures on the property. Um, I've got a number of videos from her. She's got cameras all around her house and, and motion lights. Because when this first started happening, she was afraid they were going to eat her. So she, she, uh, and she wanted to move. And her husband said, um, look, we've been here for a while. If they were going to eat you, they would have already done it. So that's obviously not their intent. And he convinced her that, that they didn't need to move. And so they'll set off the lights. Something sets off the lights. And they'll, and, and there's some intriguing videos of things that have happened on her property, but, and the horse's manes have been braided at night, things like that. But um, they, uh, these horses are used to Sasquatch or something coming on their property and, and that it doesn't bother them. They don't freak out. Um, she, so when we're out camping, um, you know, you learn to pay attention to the horses because they know a lot more what's going on around the camp than we do. And they'll all wake up. And the first thing when I wake up is I'll listen 
to see if the horses are making any noise. And um, because they'll get tangled up, horses just do that. They get tangled up in their own ropes. And they're all tied on a high tether, but they still get tangled up and then they start messing with each other and you have to get up and go on time and stuff like that. But, um, but they, they're very attentive. And, and one of her horses in particular, um, <laughs> it's the funniest thing. We'll be in camp and all the horses are looking, you know, are kind of resting and they're, they're looking in towards the camp. And this other horse is always looking out into the dark. And in the middle of the night, you'll hear her going, <laughs> Like she does when we get up in the morning and we're coming to give them their feed. Mm -hmm. so she's obviously talking to somebody out there. And I'm like, who are you talking to out there? And she does this almost every time we go camping at some point in the night, she'll be, she'll be purring to something in the woods that we can't see. And the only time we've had them freak out that she had a horse that apparently doesn't like the Sasquatch. Because when they come on their property, all the other horses don't don't care. But this one horse, he's always facing them, so you always know where they where these things are because he's watching them and he doesn't like them. So on this one night, about four in the morning, something screamed. It was not a mountain lion. Something screamed in the woods. This horse freaked out, and he was tied next to. He was a fairly big horse. He was tied next to an Icelandic horse, which are very short, stocky, strong horses. The Vikings used to use them for riding and packing, and, and Moosey can carry a ton of weight. But she's pretty short. We think he jumped all the way over her, and and three of the horses got so tangled up. I mean, their their necks were up like this. They, could, they couldn't even move. We had to come and climb up on the horses to get them untied. But that's the only time that's happened. And we've been out, I think we've done four expeditions now. I mean, we've had them untied in the night. Some Something, somebody comes and unties them. And I'll get up and they'll be off, one horse will be off grazing with its, you know, lead rope dragging. And, and so I go bring them back, tie them back up. A little later I get up, another horse is off grazing. One, one horse each time. And this horse was out of his bride, out of his uh, halter and everything. The halter and the lead rope are hanging from the tether, and he's off grazing. And I'm like, there's no way you got out of that by yourself. There's no way. And yeah. certainly not with Mal making a bunch of racket. And, and it was completely quiet. So it's interesting that if it's Sasquatch that's doing that, they're coming in the camp, middle of the night, untying the horses, maybe watching to see if we're going to wake up and see what we're going to do. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, I never worry when I get up at night and go to uh, grab a horse or bring it back. Cause I just don't think it, at least in my experience, I don't feel like there's malice there. I think if anything, they're just messing with us and seeing yeah. what we do. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would agree. I've had, you know, the times that I've shared my encounter when I was 18 years old with people, uh, their response oftentimes is, man, you're lucky it didn't kill you. And I'm thinking, well, if it wanted to kill me, we yeah. would, it would have killed dead. me a minute. One of this, not, I mean, yeah, I think that they have a, um, their most vulnerable, uh, you know, link in the in the chink in the armor is likely their curiosity, mm -hmm. and you, depending on how comfortable they are, they may expose that or express that at different levels, and sometimes making them a little bit vulnerable yeah. as they expose it. And and, and uh, I think that you know when you go out there and start knocking on trees and howling and things like that i don't think that makes them curious i think that makes them standoffish i think when you don't present a threat and you don't try to communicate with them but you're out there just doing your thing i right. think they really are intrigued trying to watch humans and witness this behavior that we express as long as we aren't, they don't consider us to be a threat. If, if they consider us to be a threat, they just simply they just stay back right. up and they're yeah. gone. Yeah. You know, if you think about that, 
you know, we've got probably 10,000 encounters that exist, let's say, um, whether they're recorded or not, but you could probably multiply that by a hundred as far as how many times people have been in the presence and Sasquatch was aware of them. They weren't aware that it was there and they did something that made it say, I don't need to be here. And they, it just simply withdraws back into that wilderness. And you, you weren't ever aware that you were near one, you know? Um, I agree. I think their tendency would be withdraw, not attack. And so, sure. you know, we're, we're not a threat to them really. Um, and when we take groups out, I don't try to keep people quiet. I'm like, the more noise we make in the camp, the better. Because once we're all in our tent and it's quiet, they're going to say, what's going on over there? I'm going to go check it out. Yeah. I think some of the most interesting approaches um, is, you know, talking to Doug's son, Blaine, Blaine Highcheck, mm -hmm. when he got the audio recordings that he got, they had mm -hmm. backpacked, I mean, a long ways into off of the grid into uh an area that on Engelworm Lake, him and his girlfriend. I mean, they had walked miles and miles and miles through. There was no the quick way back. To get yeah. back there. <laughs> and they set up camp. They were there for three days. And what was interesting is he said he thought the most high value targeted chance of getting a good auto recording would be either at night while they were, it appeared to be in their tent and not moving around or setting recorders in their camp area where they've been eating, where they've been sleeping. And when they go on their day hikes that are three, four miles long, maybe something would look at that and say, this is an opportunity to walk up and look at this campsite close. Yeah, exactly. And I think he's absolutely right. They they look for opportunities to express that curiosity and exercise that curiosity without being vulnerable. And um, and they know when we're gone and when we're there. Sure. So, yeah. No, I mean, and any creature would do that to be safe. They're not going to come into the camp when everyone's there. That's just foolishness. Um, they're going to wait even if it's a coyote or a bear or something, they're yeah. typically, they're not, everybody's sitting around the fire. They're not going to walk into the camp. So they'll wait till we're in our tents or we're gone. And then they'll sneak in and see what they can find to eat. But Sasquatch being far more intelligent than that is obviously going to choose the best moment where they're the least vulnerable. But um, yeah, I agree with you. That's, it's amazing to me though, how often they seem to come into the camp when we're asleep or they think we're asleep. And, I think uh, that's one of the interesting things that horses bring to a scenario is that it's another element yeah. to be curious about. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons, like you say, uh, the woman that you were just uh, talking about earlier that you spend time researching with, she has not only had experiences around her property, but has found horse manes braided and things like mm -hmm. this, right? I can tell you for those who maybe don't have a lot of experience with horses, first of all, um, the horses that we have are cutting horses. I mean, we use them to work herds of cattle. Yeah. Primarily that's what they spend about 300 days a year doing. Um, and then during hunting season, we use them for other things. And, these are very well-trained horses. And quite honestly, if you watched one work a herd or a lot of times we'll be at a sale barn where they're doing livestock auctions and we're cutting cattle and moving cattle around using these horses, these things operate on autopilot for the yeah. most part. I mean, the way that they react when they, when you get them targeted on a cow that you want out of that group of nine cows and moved over into this other group, the way they sit there and lean and, and cut that cow from that herd, they get very laser focused on that, but their peripheral is always present. They're always mm -hmm. aware of stuff around them. And when you ride these horses, when I'm hunting with them, 
I mean, they are aware of everything. I mean, I, I'll, I'll have a horse while it's walking, be looking fixated to the left, and yeah, I'll stop and him, and I'll yeah. start glassing it and realize there's four coyotes that are 1,200 yards out on a tree line somewhere. I mean, they're just in tune to everything. Um, no, they and are. And I'm not saying all horses are, but a lot of the horses you see used in those applications are. Well, we've got where we ride. There's a lot of uh, badger holes and 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 uh, prairie dog holes that a horse can break a leg in. And so, sure, I we've we've started only taking experienced riders because it was hard to get beginner riders to, you know, when the horse is looking off, they're looking off where the horse is looking. They should be looking in front of the horse, yeah, see where the horse is walking and guide them around these holes because. Last thing we want is is a horse to break a leg with a rider on their back, and so yeah, um, it's. But the horses are very fixed on stuff. I mean, they hear things, they smell things that we don't, and uh, and then you know, there's always a possibility they're going to spook at something that jumps out in front of them, and and uh, I'd rather have an experienced rider on their back if that happens than somebody who's looking around, you know, and as soon as the horse shifts, they're gone. I mean, they're off the horse. So, um, yeah, you, you know, and a lot of their behavior that you, you know, maybe people wouldn't be aware of this unless you spend a lot of time with horses. And that's like when I'm a, not in a group, but I'm riding a horse and we're out glassing or looking at a new spot hunting for hunting, um, if I get off and tie that horse off and walk away out of eyesight, that horse is just, not only is it watching everything, but it tries to, it's almost, I would compare it to when I'm archery hunting and I see deer to where the bucks, they want to know where each other are, right? They, so they have yeah. contact grunts. They're just, uh, just, you know, little soft grunts. And they're waiting that for they, another they one. All to grunt. Hear it. yeah, it's just saying, I'm all. over here. I know you're over there. You know, it's it helps them with lo just establish where everything is, right? And a horse will do that often. When you are walking around behind it or you're back in the, the trees to where you're just out of eye shot, I'll hear that horse bray or just softly do mm -hmm. make a vocalization where I'll – start talking loud enough for it to hear me it's just so that I want it to know where I'm at. That's why it made that yeah. sound to begin yeah. with. It's trying to say, where are you at right now? I talk back. It stays calm. Then. It knows yeah. that I'm around, but I think what you see is those horses doing that with other wildlife too, especially at night in the dark mm -hmm. that um, they do it with each other. If you've got six or eight horses, we'll take a battery pack and run a wire around where we're going to tie those horses off at night when we're out hunting, because we do hunt where there are bear and wolves and things yeah. like that. But we um, tied us up kind of an electric uh, fence around yeah. it so that um, help it with the, the uh, risk of predators. But they often all night long, you learn to, to be comfortable and actually sleep through that. Mm -hmm. Of them just softly braying and grunting to each other. Yeah. Where are you standing at? This is where I'm standing at. But I've also seen where that what you set up is step down and not down. And I didn't hear them make any sound all night long. It's almost as if something did it that they were comfortable with. And when when a coyote or something is in that area, boy, those horses will yeah. let you know. They or are a lion like, or a bear. Yeah, for boy, sure. Boy, I mean, it, it is crazy how tuned they are tuned in they are. So and you and also realize that easily. when you set that fence up or that wire up, those horses don't go near it. They understand no. where it's at, they will not touch it. And so at night when you see it knocked down and yet they didn't make any vocalization, I've asked other guides about this because I'm in a network of different hunting guides that guide big game hunters up in Montana and Idaho. And th that's when I asked them, have you ever seen anything that didn't seem to have a natural explanation? That's the type of things they talk about. 
not vocalizations wow. or wood knocks. They'll say, man, I had our horses up. The electric fence was knocked down. It looked like a human or a bear or something walked through this, right? <laughs> we know the horses didn't. And yet the horses didn't make a sound all night long. And so they were confused by that. And I'm thinking to myself, something that knocked that down was something that those horses weren't afraid of yeah, or at no, least they I, felt I, comfortable around if a coyote so, knocked that down they'd have made all kinds of noise i know so the to me those are the intriguing discussions that happen i'm not saying it was bigfoot but you know when you start going through what could have taken that electric fence down that that horse would have been comfortable with and not a, alarmed to knowing that the horse wouldn't have done it themselves yeah, that is, really gets to be an intriguing well, thought process. We don't have uh, electric wire. What we what we do is we put up um, motion like a motion light barrier behind the horses, and I can't tell you how many times in the middle of the night those lights will go on in in order one, two, three. I mean, fast like that, and you're like, and you get up and you look, and there's nothing there. I'm like. What could cross that fast between all those fields of motion and set off three lights in a row, one after the other, and there's nothing. You can't see anything. Yeah. And I, it's a mystery because, and the horses aren't reacting, but, you know, I mean, you wake up and you're like, dush, 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 and it's like, what? And you look out and you're like, there's nothing there. And a lot of times the first night when we'll go out and set up camp before any guests come, We'll just sleep out. We won't even sleep in a tent. We'll just sleep out in sleeping bags on a tarp. So you really aware of what's going on around you and noise and lights and stuff. In a tent, it's a little bit, you know, less. But, um, yeah, that, that one never ceases to amaze me that those lights will go off. It's not like one here and one here. They go off in order like something ran across that yeah. field. They were just off. tripped. And <laughs> that's interesting. It's – it's um. I often, and I've talked about this, you know, this network of guides that I communicate with and we, I send them business. They send me business. Um, and it's just interesting because, you know, if I was to ask any of them, have you ever seen Bigfoot when you're out in these remote areas? And we're talking about guides that spend probably 45 days a year yeah. to where they are really, I mean, you watch the show alone, that's the kind of areas that they're in, that type of remoteness. And, you know, if you were to ask if you ever seen anything like Bigfoot or Sasquatch, so even if they had, I don't know that they would admit that, right? Um, but when you say, have you ever seen or had anything happen to you that didn't seem to have a natural explanation as to what it could have been, Um there's a lot of interesting conversations that follow that. And mm -hmm. these are people who know what everything sounds yeah. like. They yeah. know what everything looks like from great distances away. They've spent so much time in these areas. So when they say, yeah, here's something weird that happened. Then you pay attention. <laughs> yeah. That's an, you, you, usually it will lead to something where they aren't acknowledging that this is Bigfoot or Sasquatch. And I'm certainly not going to say that it was, but almost all of those scenarios in my mind, I'm thinking it could have been because hmm. they're just, they, you get to where there isn't another plausible explanation for what they're describing, you know, but, you know, I'm not going to try to sway them in that and say, dude, that was Bigfoot, whether you yeah. realize it or not. I hate when people do that. But I mean, we don't know. We yeah, don't know. You know, I do not want to speak factually um, yeah. on a subject that we have very little facts that we operate on. If you didn't have a sighting, a visual sighting, it's like you're saying something knocks over your electric fence or sets off the lights. I don't know what it was, but whatever it was, I never saw it. And I couldn't, I couldn't tell you what it was. Um, I noticed a question here about the last question down. Um, oh. Actually, I'm interviewing Adrian Erickson tomorrow night. It's a pre-recorded show, so that question might get answered tomorrow. Um, uh, I think we talked about some of the video footage that was taken during that 
those five years of that project. Um, so if that question isn't answered tomorrow, um, write me or whatever, contact me and I'll, I'll be happy to dialogue with you about that. Sure. So, um, what in your times that you spent in the outdoors, or I should maybe open it up even further than your personal experience, but people that you consider to be people of integrity. I mean, I've got people in my circle, so to speak, that when they say this is what happened to me, or this is something mm -hmm. that I experienced, I just know them. I, I know that they wouldn't make something up. They wouldn't embellish it. I also know people that would be susceptible to do that. But, I, you know, when I establish the integrity that I give to a source, I have to start paying a little bit closer attention to what they're explaining happened to them or what they experienced. And I'm just curious, have you or somebody close to you like that, what do you think is the most remarkable thing so far that you've experienced? Um, it's a good question. Um, probably, I mean, a visual sighting is an experience. I've had one that was, that was daytime, um, about 200 yards from me up on the side of, a of the hill. It was on a rock standing looking. Was down. it in Colorado, Jim? It was in Colorado. It was about 13 miles from our store. Hmm. It was early in the morning. I was fishing at this lake. It's a very popular lake, and it's one where we've had a lot of encounters reported to us. And uh, so no one else was up at that hour. And I'm I'm always looking around. I fly fish, and so I, I had just cast. And I'm always looking around. I looked up, and I see this figure standing up there, huge figure. And I knew where it was standing. I had climbed to that spot before. And it, it was on my hands and knees. I mean, it was so steep, I could hardly get up there. And so I thought, I don't think anybody could get up there camping. And what is that? And it was all one color, very large, very tall. And I, right at that moment, a fish grabbed my fly. So like an idiot, I took my eyes off of this being and looked at the fish and looked back. I mean, three seconds max. And there was nothing there. It was just gone. And so that was that was interesting. And that was the only visual um, that I've had. I've had lots of encounters um, at night where I've had something outside my tent. And I, I sleep in a uh, in a tent, but also in a hammock a lot. And mm -hmm. Uh, I feel like a big burrito hanging there in the <laughs> woods. But I've had things pushing on my tent for minutes at a time, just pushing. I could hear their hands sliding along the tent from the outside at three in the morning. Um, and and my buddy who's next to me is just two of us, and he's in his tent with his dogs, and his dogs are growling while this is going on. So I'm like, okay, they're sensing something out there. So having, and I was too chicken to push against this, whatever this was pushing against my tent, but it sure looked like hands. Um, I've had that happen a couple of times. Um, the, uh, we've had um, other people that I know, probably the most, probably the most profound thing that anyone's ever told me about. And this guy, as you said, when you, when you know somebody, you know him. And this guy I believe is hundred percent credible. He called me out of the blue cause he just, he was one that had never told his story and he decided he wanted to tell somebody. And it had happened back in the seventies here in Colorado, not far from cripple Creek. If anyone listening knows where that is. And he, he owned a bunch of property. He was a Vietnam vet. And uh, so after the he came back from the war and and he spent a lot of time by himself out on the property. But this one day he was out there with his wife and his brother in law, I think. And so he took me to the spot and it's a, it's a big rock outcropping. And you when you're up on it and you're looking down, you can see quite a ways. He said he um, he was up there. His wife and his brother in law had gone around the backside. So he didn't he couldn't see them. 
and he looks down and he sees something down below and he's trying to figure out what it is and it stands up and he realizes it's not a bear and and so he's like oh my gosh is that a bigfoot and so he yells at his wife and his brother-in-law to come but he, they can't hear him and so he looks down again and he sees it going off and he sees it grab a smaller one and move off into the woods where he couldn't see anymore so he thinks it was a female and a and a juvenile but so they go off and he turns and he yells again for his wife and his brother-in-law he turns back and there's this big much bigger one down there walking up the hill towards him fast and I would say the distance was probably 200 yards down from where he took me. So he said it's walking up the hill and he panics and he realizes I'm in trouble. This thing's coming right up here. And so he, this guy, his name was Jim as well. Jim was up on some rocks and this Sasquatch walks right up to him, big male, and the Sasquatch is on the ground. Jim's on the rock. Jim sits down on the rock, and he's just waiting for this thing to kill him. And it walks right up, and it stands there like three feet from him. I mean, right right in front of his face, and it's just standing there. Wow. So they're eye to eye. Sasquatch, is, he, he, he figured it was nine feet tall when he measured later where he was sitting and where it was standing, and they're eye to eye. And they stand, he says he thinks it lasted five or six minutes where they just looked at each other. And he said he could give me a detailed description about his face, about his body. Um, and he said, you know, I won't go into all the description, but it's it's fascinating. And he said this, they looked at each other and he he didn't move his Jim was sitting with his arms in his lap. He didn't move anything because he was afraid if he threatened it in any way, you know, would just reach out and grab him. And so, so they just looked at each other and he said, um, at one point, Jim wanted to look down to see his whole body. So he leaned forward to look down and he said, the Sasquatch kind of stepped back and looked at him like, what are you doing? You know, with this funny look on his face. And so the Sasquatch decides it's going to walk away. And it was, there were some big, pine trees next to it so it, it picks up a branch to walk under and it stops and it came back and it leaned in real close to jim and he was he was more relaxed he realized it wasn't going to kill him after the first couple of minutes and it didn't do anything he relaxed a little bit but he said it leaned in close he could smell its breath it never opened its mouth the whole time hmm. and it looked at him like what are you and then and then stepped back and picked up the branch and walked under the tree and left. And he said, as he told me this story, he said, I said, well, if that were to ever happen again, and I'm sure it never will, because that's a once in many people's lifetime experience. And we're talking about aggression. And this thing showed no aggression towards him, except coming up to check on him, to see what he was doing. But I said, if you could do that over again, if that were to happen again, would you do anything differently? And he said, I would talk to it and see what it did. Because it never opened its mouth. I never saw its teeth. Mm -hmm. um, its eyes were dark. There was no white in the sclera. It was just dark eyes, dark, you know, iris. But um, very intelligent, very intelligent eyes and look. And so he said, I wish I had spoken to it to see if it would say something back to me or make any kind of vocalization back at me. But, you know, that was a do once and over. I mean, that was, that's never going to happen again, but um, that was probably the most profound sighting anyone's ever told me about because it was so close, lasted so long um, and he survived it. So he could tell the story later. And, and I've heard Jim tell this story now probably five times He's never changed it one bit. You can tell when someone's lying because each time they tell their story, it, it's a different story. There's something There's different a small it. inconsistencies and stuff every single time. No. So, well, I um, 
I've got a good friend of mine who guides elk hunters in Colorado, and that when I get clients who I've taken pheasant hunting or or uh-huh. have hunted in Montana with, and they ask for a referral and say we're looking at elk hunting in Colorado, I always send them to him because he's got he's just such a I really consider him a man of integrity. The guy is just the, the straightest shooter you ever saw. One of the other things he does, he's a little, quite a bit younger than me. He's in his uh, mid thirties now, but he guides whitewater rafters on the okay. Arkansas River in Buena Vista, Colorado, yeah. Browns Canyon. Yeah, I know and I well. went down and visited him, and we had stayed. Uh, I had camped uh, up on, I think it was Nine Mile. It was a lake in that, not too far from there. But mm-hmm. then we went down. To Buena Vista, and I whitewater rafted with him. And it was me and him and um, three other guides. There was there was five of us, and we needed a kind of a sixth person. We were looking for a sixth person, and so he ended up getting his girlfriend to come with. And all six of us went and spent probably about five hours that day whitewater rafting outside of Buena Vista. And... We were stopped above, depending on the time of year that that you're there, it's some pretty aggressive water to yeah. white water raft. Yeah. I mean, a lot of class four and class five rapids in certain times of the year. And we were actually eating uh, in a fairly calm area, but we were, it was right above an area where it gets really rough. And there's a lot of large outcroppings of rocks that sit three, four, five stories above the water. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, you're going through what feels like a canyon, you know. And where it narrows up like that, it usually is pretty rough. There's a lot faster, of yeah. really rough water there. And he said, you know, I'm, I, I said, have you ever had anything crazy happen? And it, at the time, I was kind of talking like, have you ever had anybody I, drown or drown, any, you yeah, know, crazy exactly. experiences? I really normally when I ask that question, I'm trying to figure out if they've had any experiences with something that could be a Bigfoot. But that, I wasn't asking them that that time. And but he told me, he says, you know, we're getting ready to go through an area that even at midwater levels is class four rapids. And when you're going through this area, it is very narrow. There's a lot of higher rocks above you, uh, and Certain areas around Buena Vista are wide open. I mean, you'll see herds of antelope standing in them. And yet yep. other areas uh, along the Arkansas River are fairly well forested. I mean, it just depends on where you're at. And he says twice now. The first time it was somebody in his raft that yelled, what's that? And I looked up on the rock and it looked like. He, and he described it. He says, it looked like a Bigfoot standing on this rock watching us go through these rapids down mm. below it. And he says, and it was the following year I had a group out there. And I started just kind of by habit looking up at these areas when we'd go through this section. And I saw it again. Wow. And I said, what do you think it was? And why do you think it was there in that same spot? He says, If you think about it, it's a spot where your peripheral disappears. The only thing you're focused on is this rough water in front of you. You are not not looking at tree lines. You're not looking up at rocks. You are scared to death half the time when you're coming through this area of water. And it got me thinking, I wonder if if it was to to recognize that that it feels comfortable expressing that curiosity. They're watching these rafts and humans go through that area because it knows. I mean, there's no way in hell you're going to pick up a ca- your phone, your smartphone, and try to take a picture of something <laughs> while you're then. going through this. You're screaming for your life half the time, when, especially the people that he guides you have never been on water like that, a lot of them. They don't have experience in this. They are fixed on that river in front of them. Yeah. Yeah. And I just thought, wow, you know, that really brought up an interesting concept that could Bigfoot actually recognize opportunities to watch somebody when their senses are 
where our senses are just simply too preoccupied to even notice that it's simply standing there. It's a great question. It's a great but, question. Um, now, when you when you rafted, were there a lot of boats on the river at the time? You know, um, we went on a Monday, and there really wasn't. But I had gotten there. Um, I had went into town that Sunday to meet with him before we went back out to where we were camping. And when I was in town, the main launch spots, there's a lot of uh, businesses that they'll launch 20, 30 boats a day. I yeah. mean, that's how big of an industry yeah. this is. So that river is very busy. I mean, it is a busy river for a couple months a year. And the day we went down it, it was pretty boring. I mean, we didn't see a lot of boats out there, you know, but, uh, not boring when you go, you through know, I, you know, on a Friday, <laughs> Saturday and Sunday, it's a lot busier, I think. So, yeah. Yeah. No, we, when we went, there were several companies that had boats on the river at the, at uh, the same time. So if you fell in and your but you couldn't get back in your boat, there would be a boat you know, close behind yeah. and grab you. Probably within a few minutes easily. And another thing is, is they all have their own areas where most of those day long trips, um, they're set up. I asked him, what does this look like on a normal day when you've got, you know, five, six people in your boat? And he says, we'll go out we launch in the morning. After about three hours, we'll pull up on, the shoreline somewhere there's uh, several pool areas where you can just swim the current doesn't drag you away um and they'll walk up kind of the elevation just different areas where you can go up and there's level areas where they will grill steaks oh wow i mean they're grilling steaks and they got potato salad and all this stuff <laughs> where it's almost like a catered meal and it's not 20 boats came together. It's just you and your boat. He sits yeah. there and fires up a little grill and pulls out a cooler and grills steaks. And it's kind of, he's the chef. He's the lifeguard. He's the everything on that trip, you know, but everybody's got their favorite little spots to stop and do yeah. that. Yeah. So within the immediate area, you know, a few hundred yards of within that river at anywhere, there's likely human traffic on that shoreline uh, throughout a given week. But then there are certain areas of that river that are, you know, half mile long where you're canyoned in with walls on each side of you. And it's a, extremely rough water to where on top of them rocks, I don't know if humans ever go up there. You know, I mean, yeah. I don't know how they'd get up there in those areas, you know? So you probably went, north of Buena Vista and came down. Yeah. Because that's the rougher, um, yeah. more skilled area than the lower section. Yeah. Well, I just, I, I you know, it was the first time I'd ever really been white water rafting. So when he said, uh, coming up, we're going to go through some class three rapids. And then you realize what class three rapids look like. <laughs> A little bit later, and he says, we have some class fours up in front of us. I'm thinking, oh, my gosh, because, I mean, class <laughs> threes were pretty rough. Class know? five. Woo. Yeah, when we started talking class five, I was just like, get me out of this damn boat. Yeah, get right me now. out of the boat. I'll walk. <laughs> yeah, for sure. But, no, but yeah, didn't... no, it was an interesting scenario of the two yeah. sightings that he had explained. Just the fact that. It was in an area where, like he said, you know, with the first time, it was a younger girl who was like 10 or 12 years old uh, who was with her parents on this. And she was kind of sitting down in the bottom of the raft while everybody else was paddling and maneuvering and screaming their heads off. <laughs> she and she look looked around. up and said, what's that? And yeah, he said, man, he said, I looked up at this thing and looked it looked like a really really large human except it was all black and it was hairy but i i think you're right those are areas probably it would be really hard to get to to be to stand where that thing was and look down at the river oh yeah because it's not a trail there's no trails up there there's nothing it's just the river and so you'd have to hike over some rough terrain to get up there just to be able to look down i mean that's well and it's an area where um there's a lot of bears around that area too. I mean, when we were camping at 
up on nine mile on the reservoir, we, um, had, it was a campground, but yet we had hiked, you know, almost a mile out from it to where we set up tents to camp. Mm -hmm. And, um, I mean, the, one of the federal officers came by and talked to us that day and, and asked us, do you have a sidearm? And I did. And I thought he was asking me because I was going to be in trouble for having, no, he was making sure that we did. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, he says, I don't want to talk to you like your third graders or insult your intelligence, but you know, we get a lot of people out here who don't have experience around bears. He says, so I'm just going to give you that my, checklist of bullet points i talked to people about and it was no food out don't leave any food out if you catch any fish down there you clean them at the boat ramp you do not bring fish back to these camps yeah. in these areas of trails and that night we had two bears in our campsite and it you know I spent a lot of time around black bears and whatnot uh, in northern Minnesota, but I've also spent time around areas that have had brown bears in them and uh, in Montana and whatnot. And so, you know, by default, I spend so much time around black bears that bears isn't the typical alarm it is for me as if it mm. was if you were somebody who lived in brown bear country, you know? Yeah. So... Although I've heard, I don't know if you've heard this, black bears don't attack as often as grizzlies. But if if a bear is going to eat you, it's probably the black bear. Not yeah, the, the the um, if you look at brown bears, typically will charge you. Brown bears might even knock you over. They might even bite you in the arm. But if a, if you were to tell most of these federal officers and these guys that have experience in investigating bear attacks that somebody had their arm ripped off or somebody lost their life. It's almost 90% of the time. It's a black bear. Yeah. I mean, they, they, the ones that choose to engage, engage. They're going to go a turn all off switch. Yeah. yeah. But well, I tell you, Jim, it was awesome having you on this well, morning. Um, who do you got coming up again so now got, this week? Um, I've got Adrian Erickson in a pre-recorded show. Cause Adrian, is currently in Zambia. So I had to call him from Bailey to Zambia. So the quality isn't fantastic because I had to do it at home, but it's, it's all right. I mean, the sound is, is good. So um, just talking about his experience with the Erickson project and the week after that, I can't remember. I, I know I've got somebody lined up, but I don't remember who it is. So I'll, I'll let everyone know tomorrow who's coming up for the next week. So it's crazy how fast these weeks go by if you just measure it from show to show, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, I, uh, I've enjoyed this. Thank you for having me on, Jeff. Yeah. Tonight I've got Brent Dill uh, from The Tall Ones on, and Brent is – we're going to talk a little bit about how when he got started in learning about Bigfoot and, and whatnot, he got hoaxed. He – kind of fell for uh, something that he thought was real and went and investigated it and looked at it closer and said, I realized that I was hoaxed. And, and it kind of caused him to look at things differently. He's never had a personal encounter yet himself, but he researches and he's out in the woods all the time looking for these signs. He's very open-minded. And he, I think he does believe that the, they are real um, but, uh, hmm. when he hears somebody talk about experiences and stuff, he looks at things a little bit differently, obviously after feeling like sure. he'd been deceived at one point, sure. but he uses that to his advantage. I see other people in the community that kind of their niche is to just expose hoaxers and, and you know, that's not really that he doesn't really take that in your face approach to that, but he is very realistic about uh, details and what should be there, what you should be able to recall when things happen to you. And it, it'll be an interesting conversation because he's also got lots of things that he's experienced uh, with people as far as seeing uh, forest language, things like that, that, leave a little bit of a question mark it, 
did a person make this? Could be, probably, but then again, he's time. seen some other things that he's like, he saw something as simple as a stick that wasn't a huge stick that was drove into the ground at the narrow end, quite a ways into the dirt. And the end that was exposed was all frayed out. And it looked like if I took a knife and just kept taking mm. the edge until it just looked like it was all frayed out. And he says, you know, what would have, what would have done something as simple as that trying to come up with a natural explanation yeah. as to what happened how did this yeah. get here it's a i'm looking at it thinking man i've seen a lot of things but i don't if you're asking me how what did that i don't can't come up with a very good explanation so nope i'm excited to talk to him tonight it should be what time is show. your show tonight uh it will be nine eastern eight central so seven o'clock your time in colorado well, great. But yeah, it was great having you on. I enjoyed the conversation, and uh, we will stay in touch and be talking soon. Okay. Thanks, All Jim. Right. Thanks, Jim. Bye-bye. And that is another coffee time. I sure appreciate everybody showing up. Um, we've been getting a pretty good collection of people watching it live but i know we get an awful lot of people who listen on podcasts and we certainly appreciate that too whatever platform you listen on if you ever want to check us out if you're listening on podcast you can find us at untold radio network here on youtube um subscribe turn your notifications on and we've got at the moment, eight or nine different uh, shows that occur throughout the week um, that kind of cover all areas of of interest. I mean, they're like Jim's show on my show, uh, kind of focus more on the the Sasquatch uh, phenomena, but um, mysterious libraries with Dr. Dean and Jason. They talk about all areas of the paranormal, and there's everything in between. Um, Doug's show, kind of the flagship show of the network uh, called Untold Radio, he does with his son, Alex. And they have interesting guests from all walks of life on there. And uh, that's also a great show to check out. But all of them, I would say I would describe the network as there is something here for everybody, but I certainly don't expect I've got a lot of people who watch my show for the nuts and bolts approach to Sasquatch research that say, I'm not really into those other areas of paranormal. I get that. There's other people who maybe check out the shows that cover ufology, but they aren't into anything else. But, um, there's certainly something here for everybody. So turn your notification bell on and at least check out and see if this is a show you'd like. Uh, I myself, I, I'm i kind of gotten addicted to watching a lot of the other shows, even ones that aren't kind of in my corner of the room, so to speak, just because uh, I don't have to agree with somebody to be able to learn something from them. And I find that happening often. So I would encourage everyone to, uh, who's listening on podcasts to at some point come check us out on YouTube. And, and also, if you're just typically watching it when you're at home with nothing to do on YouTube, but you've got the ability to access the podcast platforms while you're at work or while you're driving in your car, do so. Pick your favorite one, whether it's iTunes, Spreaker, Spotify, uh, iHeartRadio, we are on all of the platforms. Just find Untold Radio AM and you will be able to access all the shows that you see here on YouTube. So other than that, I would like to tell everybody, I hope you all have a great week. I hope everybody's doing well and uh, got a lot of inconsistent weather out there across the country. Typically spring in our area up here, 
uh, comes with a lot of threats. And we get high water levels depending on the rainfall, flood level, uh, uh, flood threats. We get tornado activity. I mean, there's, we're kind of entering that time of year where uh, there's a lot going on weather-wise. So everybody be prepared, be safe uh, as we enter this spring. And I look forward to seeing you guys all next week. Thank you.